um, we who work here enjoy the events and um, publishers actually notice when people come to the events and that's why we have more and more variety of speakers because um, authors encourage one another, publishers and agents encourage people to come here and it's all because you show up. So thank you so much. Today we're fortunate to have three authors who, as I understand it, consider themselves seekers. Um, very often spiritual seekers become inspirational writers to try to um, reflect on what they learned along the way and in that way they become potential guides for the rest of us. So we're looking forward to their presentations today. Um, some of them have written more than one book and it turns out that um, Brian Pierre Grossi, Grossi has a new book since we put out our publication information. And so the one that I think you'll be drawing on most today is The Wow of the Now. And we do have all these books in stock. You'll have an opportunity afterwards if you'd like to have them signed. And we're going to ask that you hold questions to the end of the event. We'll be sure to plan time for questions. Um, but I know people who come to events at Malabrops have great questions, and we don't want to use all the time on one speaker and questions and not have, not have the opportunity to hear the others. So please hold your, your questions to the end, and if you would join me now, let's welcome our speakers for the afternoon. And I am going to ask them to introduce themselves so that you don't have to listen any longer to me. But the first one is Trey Carland. <laughs> Hello, and thank you for coming. Um, <clears throat> got a little sore throat, so bear with me. Okay, that works. Can you hear me? Testing. Okay, that works for me. Um, I wanted to start by saying, on my way over here, I started getting nervous about the whole thing. Found myself sort of, you know, getting jittery about the, the event. So I decided, okay, well, let's let's look at this for a second. So I checked in to see maybe what was at the root of that feeling of anxiousness, and it's like this is that that old programming, that old feeling of inadequacy, sort of rearing its head and um, manifesting mani manifesting as this sort of nervousness. So. I then looked at what the feeling was like in the body, and I took the the word nervousness out of the out of the equation, and I felt this sort of just tingly feeling in different parts of my body, and realized that this this isn't really nervousness. This is excitement. This is like eagerness. And telling the story of nervousness just made me contract and feel feel small. But then when I got rid of the word, I realized just how exciting this is. So. I'm excited to be here. And in fact, I, I started screaming out the window of the truck once it once it dawned on Yahoo! Um, and that, that was like the release I needed from this this sort of uh, potential spiral into nervousness. But I had to share that before we get started. <clears throat> um, my journey started in probably 2005, but it actually started my life started changing in 2004 when I started having these, these periodic spells that um, at the time I didn't know what was going on. I was just calling them revelation spells because that's what it felt like. It felt like, oh wow, I got this rush of energy and everything made perfect sense all of a sudden. And it'd last for a minute or two and then pass and I'd be left with this, wow. What, what was it? I forgot what the, what the answer was to everything. And I try and remember, and I never could quite grasp what it was that had gone through my head right before one of these things started. And this happened a few times up until uh, November 7th of 2004. And that day, I had a similar episode, but ended up having a grand mal seizure that... Um, I blacked out and woke up and there were EMTs coming to see me and, and I was rushed to the ER and there was this doctor there and he said, you've had a seizure. And I was just sort of, and then I remembered having that feeling right before I blacked out. And so it got me on this, this path 
of why me? What what's the meaning of life? Why are why are we here? What what's going on? And there was this invisible force driving me to find out. And it was just, it was like I didn't have a choice but to start reading books and doing research on various and sundry subjects. And that went on for about a year. I was just consuming books on religion and science and um, anything, just looking for answers. Um, and then, and I started seeing a counselor too during that period of time who turned me on to Eckhart Tolle and his teachings. And it, it finally hit me. This is what I've been looking for. This, this word called enlightenment. Now I can focus my energies and efforts on this, this thing, if you want to call it a thing. Um, so that's kind of what got me where I am today. This book is about all the different um, realizations, revelations, uh, experiences, life-altering experiences that I've had along the way. Um, and it's actually a really good book. I feel like when I go back and I reread this thing that, wow, that's a good book. <laughs> As you can tell by all the page markers, I had to take out some because I knew I wouldn't find my way to what I wanted to share, but um, it's, it's also got a lot of resources for teachers that have um, been influential for me. Um, but let me find... Oh, um, is anybody here familiar with the present moment? Yes. A couple of you? Okay. All right, well, well, you're soaking in it right now, all right? So let's, let's get introduced to the present moment, shall we? Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Now relax all your muscles. Take another deep breath. Now, you're here, and it doesn't matter what happened five minutes ago, five seconds ago, five years ago, you're here now. And you're breathing. You can feel your heart beating. And when you're fully, fully here, with no past to refer to for meaning, then all the labels, definitions, and stories that you've learned <clears throat> throughout your entire life fall away. And you're left with nothing to define things with. So when you look around without any stories or labels or definitions, you don't really know what you're seeing. When you look at things from a place of fully present moment awareness, there's just this. Any attempt to define this is the past coming in to say, my experience is that this is a table. This is a chair. When you're fully present, there is no table. There is no chair. There is no me. There's just this. When you sit there basking in the just thisness of this, and you're not making any stories up to define things, your mind will probably come in and want to explain some things to you. It'll, it'll express some doubt. So when you have thoughts pop up, I recommend 
you just start thinking blah 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 visualize the words blah 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 now recognize those words as being words thoughts they're in front of you you're looking at them you're witnessing these thoughts blah 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 now look at what's aware of those thoughts blah 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 what sees those words what hears those words blah 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 there's this silent space underneath the blahs before the blahs come up and that silent space is what you might refer to as a witnessing presence. When you witness your thoughts from that space, you're breaking your identification with thought. So it might seem, might seem silly to just say blah, blah, blah whenever you find yourself caught in repetitious thought. But what you're doing is you're giving yourself a point of reference say they're blahs and here's me witnessing blahs and who is this me that's witnessing when you direct your attention toward that that witness what's there there's just this silent space sort of nothingness out of which everything emerges the blahs appear out of nothing they disappear into nothing and when you do this you might spend some time after you've discovered that silent space just resting in it basking in it nowhere to go nothing to do Nothing that's ever happened matters. It's just this silent, peaceful space. It's always here. It's underlying everything. just reading and researching and looking for answers and having lots of little uh, miniature realizations along the way and um, like I said this book's got a lot of them but one of the more <coughs> profound experiences I had which um, might consider my first real awakening happened in 2007 and this one I called navigating the switch Since this is old blog posts, I tend to start with little uh, little greetings, but this one starts off. Hope you're doing well and enjoying the transition of the seasons as fall begins to get situated. A couple of weeks ago, a few days after my last seizure, I had what might be called an awakening experience that lasted most of a day. We were in the car on a beautiful day. My wife was driving and I was just taking in the scenery on a stretch of road that I'd seen hundreds of times before. I started to do an eyes open meditation technique I had read about the day before, which included the typical suggestions of relaxing tense muscles, letting go of thoughts as they arise, etc. After a few moments of this, a strange sensation began to occur. It was the sense of fear, almost like the stage fright you might encounter before making a speech. As it intensified, I felt some tension in my body as well. The sensation was almost like an aura of what was about to happen. 
Instead of trying to change the mental subject, as I have done before when encountering this type of fear, I relaxed and surrendered into it. The message I received while I was on the tipping point was, you're doing it for humanity, which gave me that final push I needed to fully give in to what was about to happen. At that point, warm, tingly sensations began to occur in my body. It grew more intense and felt almost orgasmic in nature. I was overcome with a feeling of joy and ex exhilaration. It seemed to escalate to a point and then evened out as I took in the be beautiful scenery around me, which had suddenly become vivid and alive. I realized that I was seeing everything for the first time ever, and that I was seeing it without a mental story or label attached to it. Everything made perfect sense, without the need for thoughts to reconcile it. It was a sense of knowing that settled over me that allowed me to see the beautiful necessity in everything that's happening in the world, including the wars and all forms of suffering. As the full implications of this felt knowing flooded my body, I was on the verge of tears. Not tears of sorrow, but tears of joy. Before they started flowing, I found myself quietly laughing. <clears throat> it all made perfect sense. I finally got the cosmic joke. You are what you seek. The truth of who we are is hidden right under our noses where it's no wonder it gets overlooked. Though it was beyond what words could describe, it was like seeing how we are all perfectly connected in a way that makes us creators and products all at the same time. I had this sense that we we're all pawns in a cosmic conspiracy to bring about this moment and to see and experience it fully. It occurred to me that everyone with whom we ever come in contact with, and even those we don't, regardless of how seemingly insignificant the encounter, are part of this conspiracy, whether they know it or not. The end goal of the conspiracy is to get us to awaken. I also realize that everyone I see is actually a reflection of myself. They too are the same thing I am, and the only difference is a perceived difference I've placed on them, which actually says more about me. None of these realizations were in the form of thoughts, as thoughts seemed to be relatively absent. Instead, they were just known or felt. If ever a thought began to form, it was instantly met with a sort of reassurance. For example, I started to wonder if this experience would end, and if I would be able to get back to this point if it did. But I was reassured that I did not need to be concerned before that thought had even completely formed. It felt as if I was assured that I would be able to return again and again and that this was just a sample. This allowed me to remain present without worrying about an unknowable future. Interestingly enough, when my wife asked the question or if I was in some other way called upon to do something, I seemed to be able to snap out of it without losing my connection. My actions also seem to be much clearer, decisive, and without any tension. The sense of joy and wonder remained in the background and available for me to step back into a will. I felt like I was learning to negotiate the switch, so to speak. <clears throat> On the drive home, I smelled a very potent dead skunk smell. However, before the mind could step in and label it as bad, it was realized that the only thing that made it a bad smell was past experience. Instead, it took on somewhat of a sweet smell all its own. It was actually rather pleasant. Sounds crazy, but... Throughout the rest of the day, I took great joy in whatever I did, whether it was doing laundry, feeding the dogs, just watching and wondering as everything happened of its own accord. I was doing it all for the first time without any stories from days gone by. That night, the dinner we ate was among the best I'd ever tasted. I was savoring every bite. I had to stop myself from groaning with pleasure um, as that was bothering my fellow diners. <laughs> In short, it was a great experience that I savored until I went to bed that night. The next day, I woke up to my normal mental activity, but with a, re a residue of the pleasure I had encountered the day before. It faded over the course of the next day as I had work to do in preparation for a business trip. Though I've tried a number of occasions since then to reconnect, I've not had much luck. 
I've also spent a fair amount of time mentally analyzing the experience, knowing that it would not get me back to that point. <clears throat> I'm very fortunate to have experienced that, which I've been reading about for the last couple of years, and I realize I'm apparently not quite ready to live it on a full-time basis. I recognize now that it is always here and can be experienced by anyone, anytime, if they're interested. I highly recommend it and look forward to being there, here, again, in the near, quote unquote, future. <clears throat> I wonder if we could stay in the present and invite Gajan at Sure, that would be fine. Is there more of it? <laughs> okay, Gajan is up next. <laughs> Anna's book is Dying into This. She'll speak with us right now. It's great to see everybody. I'm author of Dying into This. It's the white, white book. Um, and I'll read the preface just because that actually gives you a little more insight into my own personal journey um, on the spiritual path. Uh, I'm founder of lampoftheheart.org, uh, which supports the production of materials that cultivate loving compassion in the world. And I hold a bi-weekly satsang on the first and third Thursday of the month at Town and Mountain Training Center. So if you're ever around, it's at 7.30. And join us. What's the center called? It's Town and Mountain Training Center. It's off Ashland Avenue. I may need to put this down just a bit. There are many significant points in one's spiritual journey that have a profound impact on our lives. For me, this book represents one aspect of this never-ending journey home. The whole of the spiritual life is about returning home in every instance. This realization of home can happen in a day, in an instance, or in a flash, but the unfolding of it in our life happens in time. What is written here frames a period in my life when I had been relieved of my belief in separation and was submerged in the experience of no self. This book is a flash of insights I had when I was resting in this place of new awareness. It is what I call the cave time of awakening. This was a time following some very deep insights into my truest nature, seeing that I am everything, that I am nothing, and then simply I am, and then not even that. I had spent an intense year devoted to stillness, after attending several weeks of silent retreats with a masterful teacher, it left me with nothing. Nothing as I knew it before. And a live nothing that I continue to discover each moment. Just when you think you have it, it's gone, because there's nothing to have. What is captured in these pages is valuable, although it is static. It points to waking up to life as one and everything that entails, which means the falling away of all identity, all concept, all belief. We must stand naked in the heart of God. From this point, there will never again be anything to cling to, for life shifts continually. That is the only continuity, change. So as I have continued to grow into my spiritual heart, so do the insights that come through as a direct experience of my life lived. I share as I know, and that is the most authentic offering I can make. Anything else is confusion. My journey into a life devoted to the knowledge of God was written from the start. The horrific life I was born into was orchestrated perfectly to break the binds of confusion heavily wrapped around my family lineage and personal belief in separation. This traumatic beginning was my birthright. What I experienced at this early age contributed to the awakening of my human heart. It was in meeting the trauma of my past where I found the gateway to grace, freedom, and transformation. This transformative power is also in you. How we choose to meet the circumstances of our lives is our one opportunity to shift the consciousness of the world from deep despair to insurmountable joy. And it starts with you. You are the light. You hold the key. There is no excuse. There is no victim. There is only your choice of perception. 
I can say this with authority, having known one of the most brutal existences a child could have ever been exposed to. Severe abuse at the hands of both parents, including sexual molestation. Coming near death at the hands of my mother. Abuse from caregivers, daily psychological degradation, alcoholism, bulimia, anorexia, drug addiction, becoming a mother at 19, physical abuse in romantic relationships, and on and on. Trauma, severe trauma. That which makes even the most seasoned therapist cringe and wonder, how in the hell are you not dead or insane? And my answer, my knowing, has always been God. This is my path. It does not mean it is yours. My heart yearns to share this freedom. Simply, this book is an offering to my family. That includes all of you and all beings on this planet to know the love that they are. Knowing this love heals the deepest wounds. It releases the most ensnared confusion and liberates the most bound soul. It makes me celebrate to know that sharing the only thing that I can, life as I know it, can offer space enough for you to realize this love for yourself. Through this love, the gates of heaven open, and there you can rest. Rest. Be what you are. Love unending. This is how we will change the world one heart at a time. Your heart is the only one that matters. Tend to it, reveal it, let life come in. I don't know how much time, is that 15 minutes, is that good? Um, or should I read a bit more? You can maybe a couple minutes more, that's a lovely passage. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That was just the preface. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll read just a little bit of chapter two. Because this is a really long chapter. Chapter two is entitled Seeking. Relax, be curious, and to discover the truth of what you are once and for all. You can't mess this up. What are we all doing here? I mean, right now, in this moment. It's only one of two things. We're either running away from our lives, or we're completely showing up for them. Most of us are running. I think the entire human race is running madly away from what is here, save a small handful of souls. Really, this entire movement of avoiding reality of our lives is set in motion to avoid suffering. We are convinced that if we just keep moving, then we won't have to feel pain. So we busy ourselves. We have a million things on our to-do list, engagements to keep, people to please, and money to make. Yet ironically, here life is waiting for us to stop be still, and show up. Have you noticed you can never get away from it? It's like a drug addict who takes a drug to feel high and escape their problems. The sting of it is that after the drug wears off, there they still are with the same pain and problems that they took the drug to avoid. And usually the pain and problems are amplified following the escapade. So we try to run away from our problems, thinking that will solve them or make them disappear. But you can't outrun life no more than you can outrun your shadow. At the root of any effort to not fully be here is the energy of fear. Thank you. And Brian Piergosi with the wow of now. Still in the present. <laughs> for adjusting my microphone. <laughs> so, um, The Three Seekers is a, in, the, in, the, in the title of the, um, the gathering today, so I wanted to say something quick about that. I actually wanted to quote, uh, this is also occurring to me in the last couple of minutes, so I wanted to quote Rumi, 
uh, Rumi line came to mind, or Rumi poem came to mind. I have been dancing on the lip of insanity, wanting to know reasons, knocking on a door. It opens. I've been knocking from the inside. And so, as in regards to being a spiritual seeker, there's this sense of um, you're seeking, you're putting in all this energy and this investment, and there's this, this trophy you're going to get, and you're going to have it, and you're going to see it, and you're going to be able to show it to everybody. It's that God that I was looking for. Here it is. Here's my enlightenment, myself, whatever it is, self-realization, my kingdom of heaven, whatever it is you're looking for, it's a, it's a mental concept in your mind that you're, that you're looking to acquire that's keeping you from fulfillment. And, and initially, when you're, when, you're, when you're in the materialistic realm, it could be a new car, it could be a new man or woman, it could be, uh, it could be a certain amount of money, and then you go into the spiritual realm, it's, it's these more abstract conceptual ideas, but it's the same game, still, played in a different way. And it's, it can be more difficult to catch yourself. So, so what I've seen that happens is you never get that trophy and you don't want it anymore. What you want is this, this, and you have it. And that's when the spiritual seeking ends and you are here in the moment in the present and everything that you want is here as if you're creating it. Because in the sense of non-duality, in the sense of no separation, in the sense of oneness, who is creating it? It must be you, because there's nothing separate from you. So you must be a part of whatever is being created. So why not be here? As Ram Dass said, be here now. And then you open up to the, the wow, the wow of the now. Um, Awakening to the Big Low Within, that's the subtitle. And you realize that everything's happening right now. There's never anything that's not happening right now. So this is the gateway to all that's happening. And so in realizing that, being here, being present, is of the highest importance. It's more important than anything that's going to happen in five minutes, or in five years, or five years ago, or five minutes ago. Because we're thinking about those things now, we're thinking about the future now, we're thinking about the past now, it's never not right now. Um, I have a friend um, named Ash, a great spiritual teacher and a big friend of mine who, who he invites people to, okay, try as hard as you can not to be here now. Scrinch, you can move in, scrinch your muscles. Oh, gosh, I'm still here. I can't not be here. And so why not accept it and really embrace it and really be here with what's here, whatever it is. So it includes everything. It's not the sense of try to be happy. Um, trying to be happy is not fully being here. So there's not the full freedom in trying to be happy, making effort to be happy. There's not the full sense of inner peace in trying to be happy. There's the full sense of freedom and, and inner peace and empowerment in embracing whatever arises unconditionally, and being with whatever arises unconditionally, um, the full range of, of life. That's where there's the sense of inner peace and, and, and freedom and empowerment. So I should read something from the book, I think, since, <laughs> since I think I should. Um, <laughs> So, let's read this. This work, this teaching, this play, this game, this movement is not about trying to be happy or trying to think positive. It's about an unconditional, authentic relationship with this moment. An authentic, genuine, honest relationship with this moment is the foundation for truly wholesome living. When we're in a place 
of complete harmony and union with this moment, there is no longer any, quote, relationship with this moment because there is no longer seen to be anyone separate from this moment to have a relationship with it. There is no one left. You no longer exist as a separate entity. There is only life, which means there is only this moment. This moment is you, whole, complete, and undivided. The vitality of life is always happening right now, not in the future or in the past. This moment is timeless, infinite, and without borders, like a seamless coat, without separation or division. It's a miracle, and you are deep inside it right now. Everything is a reflection of the one and only self. The natural byproduct of this self-realization, this realization of oneness, is a sense of inner peace, inner freedom, natural altruism, relaxed sense of humor, and heightened sense of creativity and responsibility in alignment with the vast, infinite intelligence of the universe. Did you know you were this cool? <laughs> so I will um, share one more than to say a couple things and then we'll open up for questions for everyone. This one's, um, well, let's just read it. Called My Intelligence. I used to think my intelligence was seated in my brain. So when I spoke of my intelligence, I pointed at my head. Then I thought the actual center of my intelligence was in my heart. So when I spoke of intelligence, I pointed at my heart. Then I realized my intelligence was everywhere. It's in every cell in my body, in every cell all around me as well, in each moment. So now, I don't know where to point anymore. I can't point everywhere. So now, when I speak of my intelligence, I will point my finger at you. Oh. One more quick. <laughs> this one really wants to be read because it keeps showing up, so I guess I'll read that one. Can you ever know someone completely? Whatever knowledge you have is based on the past. Continually knowing and unknowing another each day, each moment, opens the space for the deepest intimacy, vibrancy, vulnerability, and presence. It is then that you can say, quote, I love you, I see you, I don't know you, but I'm willing to discover you anew in each moment. So thank you all for being here. Um, if you want to go in more depth with myself, I'll be at a place called the Sacred Embodiment Center tomorrow night at um, 7 p.m. And it's on 41 Carolina Lane. And if you don't know where that is, you can just talk to me a little bit and give you more information and lots of other ways to plug it to open up for questions. So we're going to go up for questions now for all three of the authors, including myself. Do you want to? Well, I was going to say you're welcome to stand together or sit together so that people can address all of you. My guess is that there um, might be a number of questions that three people would want to respond to. But if anyone has a question, please do ask it. <laughs> or we'll start asking you questions. <laughs> I don't want that. So 
Hi, Brian. Yes, hi. Um, I was just wondering what your other uh, books are that you've authored, and if you've had a, a transformational experience that caused you to become a oh. writer. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, the other book's called The Big Low. The Big Low, Insight, Inspiration, Peace, and Passion. And this is the second book, The Wild and Now, Waking to the Big Low Within. Um, yeah, I, I, I had a severe illness when I was 20 years old. Um, I'll try to make this short, but um, it was a sort of mysterious illness that just went on and on, and they, 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 the doctors didn't seem to have an answer for it, but still wanted to prescribe drugs, which I found interesting. Um, and so I just was at a place where Everything, everything the way I thought my life was going to go, it just seemed like it wasn't going that way. And there's this whole other surprise turn um, that really made me question what life is really about and what do I really know about anything and, and why was I in pain and what is the cause of, of suffering. Um, so I really then gave my life to figure out what's the cause of suffering for myself, but then also humanity as well, and that's when I really began my, began my spiritual search. That was at 20 years old, and, and, and that was really my, my one point in awareness um, from that point forward. And so I find for, for most people, um, what starts with spiritual search is, is suffering. And, and so in that sense, suffering has value if we give our attention and we give our awareness to it, and it allows us to open up to the deeper essence of, of who we are. And it's been... Um, a wonderful adventure since, since that point. Thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the greatest gifts I ever got was the diagnosis of epilepsy. And um, I, to this day, am grateful for the positive changes of come about because of that. And it's another one of those strange things where we've given this disorder a name called epilepsy. And 70% of the cases, nobody knows what the cause is. But it makes it easier for us to discuss and talk about and study if we give things a, a label. So years and years of research and still the definition of epilepsy is somebody who, who's had two or more seizures. So um, the doctors may have pointed back toward those little revelation spells as partial complex seizures. Um, but that again is just a word that medicine has come up with so that we can talk on the same playing field as one another. And call it what you want, it was, it was the <laughs> impetus I needed to bring me here today. And so I have no regrets whatsoever. Oh, while I'm here, I've got these, these quote cards. I'm going to pass them out, take two, and pass them along. Other comments or questions? Um, I was just curious, a couple of you mentioned that you were impacted by teachers um, that helped you to formulate your thinking or feeling. I know um, Trey mentioned Eckhart Tolle. Um, who were your teachers, just out of curiosity? Some of the ones that really impacted you. Questions about who are important teachers to each of them. I would have to say living. There's many, you know, obviously living and those that have passed, but living is definitely um, Adya Shanti. I uh, went on several retreats with him and it was very powerful. Um, he is a uh, wise soul and knows how to hold a space so that you can be returned to your inner autonomy, which is what I um, hope to share with people that come to, to sit with me. It's, it's always about returning yourself to your own inner teacher, your inner wisdom. <laughs> Eckhart Tolle has been a, a, a big inspiration for me as well. I definitely would, would recommend him as far as spiritual teachers go. Um, 
my son has been a huge source of spiritual inspiration for me. Um, and children in general, I think, can be a huge source of spiritual inspiration, spiritual teachers. And many spiritual teachers throughout the ages have pointed to the children as examples to, to look at, to, um, to embody many of the principles of um, self-realization and spiritual realization and liberation. And life itself is really the biggest teacher of all. Um, and, and, and what I, I don't usually quote other people, but another quote comes to mind, which is actually in my other book, this, uh, Meister Eckhart, one of my favorite quotes of all. If the only prayer you ever say your entire life is thank you, that should suffice. And, and when, you come from, when you come into your day from that perspective, then, then everything has the potential to be, to be a teacher for us. And every challenge is an opportunity to, to learn and to, and to grow. Um, I also have to send out big props to Byron Katie. She's, she and Eckhart Tolle, I guess, have been the most influential, but Byron Katie's got what's called the work, and that's helped cut through layer after layer of BS in my life and helped me realize that um, the only cause for suffering in this world is believing your thoughts. And that teaching alone is enough to shake the foundation of what you believe. Um, our beliefs that we hold so sacred are actually what are preventing us from seeing what's real and finding happiness, um, inner peace, whatever. Beliefs alone are a wall. And Byron Katie says all that very well. She's one of my favorites. Um, and I think if she, I remember correctly, she had a prayer that said, if I had a prayer, which she doesn't because she loves what is. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, please spare me from the desire to please and be loved by other people. Um, and I think that kind of says it all. It's kind of a comment, but each of your your background stories is kind of filled with disaster, and yet here you are, and that is that is so inspirational. I mean, we all have our own background stories, and I hear yours, and I think like mine was simple, <laughs> all my junk, and you made it to here. Thank you, thank you. That's, that's I don't know if all of you heard, but it's an expression of gratitude that all of our speakers today have had some very difficult times in the past, a lot of pain, and yet they're here, and that's very inspirational. And I have to say, your voices are all wonderful. <laughs> I think you have something in there that <laughs> really is um, authentic, because it's just great to hear you speak. <laughs> I think we'll um, make things less formal now and um, say that if you'd like to purchase books, we do have them in stock, and they're located at the large desk across the room. They're right next to the cash register, as you can guess why. But I think our authors will sign them for free in the moment or in the next few minutes, and maybe even after that, because there are opportunities to um, be with some in other settings. We'll also try to remove some chairs pretty quickly so it's easier to circulate if you'd like to speak with one another as well as with the authors. Thank you again for coming today.